Welcome to the Shuv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. Tonight's feature is episode one of the three-part series, Fascinating First Fruits, The Feasts, and a Surprising Revival. Episode one is foundational to our discussion and is entitled, First Things First. This episode contains probably some of the most important things I can share with you, apart from salvation through the work of Messiah Yeshua. So please don't skip episode one. Okay, let's get right to it. First things first. Let's start with Psalm 32, an awesome mesquil of David that really covers the bases. Okay, Tehalim, Psalms 32, of David, a mesquil. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality drained away, as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Hashem, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check, otherwise they will not come near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in Hashem, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in Hashem, and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. End quote. Turn your heart and your mind to the Lord, Hashem. He not only is our King, Kohen Gadol, High Priest, and Savior, He is also our Teacher. We can trust His promise from Psalm 32, 8, where He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. With that in mind, before delving into the topic of the appointed times called First Fruits, I would like to cover three essentials in this first episode. Number one, steps to correctly study the scriptures. Number two, steps to determine the truth of a thing. And three, the biblical definition of the term First Fruits and a short word about the biblical calendars. Okay, let's get into the three essentials. With these three essentials... Number one, six indispensable steps to correctly study the scriptures. They are proper premise, context, culture, literature or poetry, original languages, and the Ruach HaKodesh as teacher. Okay, let's start with the first one. Proper premise. When studying the Bible, starting with a correct premise or assumption is critical. It is impossible to arrive at correct interpretations if your starting premise is faulty. Let me say that again. If your mindset assumptions are in error, it is impossible to come to accurate analysis. Wrong premises remain one of the biggest reasons why there are over 45,000 different denominations in Christianity. So what is the definition of a false premise? A false premise is an incorrect proposition or assumption that forms the basis of an argument and renders it logically unsound. For example, the argument, quote, all birds can fly and penguins can't fly, so penguins aren't birds, end quote. The premise that all birds can fly is actually false, since the truth is some birds can't fly. This renders the argument logically unsound. The, conclusions that, the conclusion that penguins aren't birds is wrong. Likewise, listen to this common argument. This is an actual quote that I found. Quote, The Ten Commandments and the rest of the Mosaic Law were nailed to the cross with Christ. Jesus did not eliminate the law, but perfectly fulfilled it. That is, i.e., the contract was completed and didn't carry over into the Christian age. End quote. Can you spot the false premise? Actually, there are more than one. This statement is wrong on many levels. The first statement, quote, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Mosaic Law were nailed to the cross with Christ, end quote. 
That is a false premise. The correct premise, according to Scripture, is it was the curse of the law that was nailed to the cross, our debt penalty for breaking the Mosaic law, the terms of the ancient covenant. Galatians 3.13 says, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. End quote. Remember the brazen serpent hung up on the pole of the wilderness? Well, this was a prophetic picture of this. The curse, the consequence for sin, was hung up. They looked up, acknowledged their sin, and were healed, forgiven. Quote, the law was nailed to the cross, end quote, is an erroneous premise. It's not the law that's deficient. We are. The next line, quote, Jesus didn't eliminate the law but perfectly fulfilled it, i.e., that is, the contract was completed, end quote. In part, that is a false premise. The correct premise, according to the scripture, their statement that Jesus, Yeshua, perfectly fulfilled the law is correct, but not in the way they think. Their premise that, quote, the contract was completed, end quote, and thereby no longer in effect, is false because the truth is, biblical Near Eastern blood covenant does not have an expiration date. You cannot delete a blood covenant. The contract is ongoing. Leolam forever. Blood covenant. According to our creator, blood covenant is a forever thing. Go search the scriptures and see how many times he says forever in regards to a covenantal statement. Do your due diligence. Don't just be spoon-fed. So their conclusion that the Mosaic law did not have to carry over into the Christian age is logically unsound. Their conclusion is based on a false premise. When Messiah Yeshua returns, you can be assured that the law of the land will be the written Torah. Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. And that means written Torah as he understands it. And his premises are always right and proper. The foundation of Torah is the law of Moses. Who do you think gave the terms of the blood covenant at, at Mount Sinai? Who did they see? Torah reveals the heart of God. It always existed. God himself says he doesn't change. The 613 plus commandments in the foundational scriptures reveal the heart of God and are the lifestyle of the redeemed community. So when you study the scripture, it is essential that you start with that proper premise. Scripture is founded on blood covenants, and they are forever covenants. Messiah Yeshua did not do away with, quote, the law. That's not how Near Eastern Biblical Covenant functions. With this truth in mind, the dots will begin to connect for you when you read the Bible. For 2,000 years, a fog of deception has clouded the minds and actions of most who say they believe. Okay, the next step in helping you correctly study Scripture is context. You know, you can make the Bible say anything if you yank verses out of context. If you torture the data, it will confess to anything. Instead, you have to read the entire chapter, the entire book, and position it in light of the entire Bible, Genesis through Revelation. A matter is established by two or three witnesses according to Deuteronomy, Devarim. A command reiterated in the Brit Hadashah, the Renewed Covenant, Matthew through Revelation. Here's two verses. Devarim Deuteronomy 19.15, quote, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed, end quote. And then reiterated in Matthew 18.16, quote, But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. Another word about context, just because you read about a person doing a certain, certain thing in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that the conduct is okay by the Lord. The Bible presumes that you know the foundational written Torah. That action must be stacked up against the measuring stick of the terms of the covenant. Here's an example. You see Jacob taking more than one wife. So is that behavior a good practice to copy? Well, what did Messiah Yeshua say? Look at Matthew 19. The context here is the question of divorce. But Yeshua points out that the two are one flesh. Male and female, by the way. I'm just saying. Matthew, Matthew, Yahoo 19, verses 3 through 6. Quote, 
Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Yeshua replies, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. The same account is reiterated in Mark 10. So in the beginning, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam, Eve, and Stella. Remember, Adam named his wife Eve, or in Hebrew, Chava. Scripture reports in Bereshit, Genesis 3.20, the man named his wife Eve, Chava, because she was the mother of all the living. One man, one woman. That was God's original word on this issue. So when you read a historical account in Scripture, you must first discover what is the first command, what is the original word God spoke regarding that issue. That is absolutely key to arriving at a proper decision or conclusion. The action must be held up to the measuring stick of the foundational Torah and its terms of the blood covenant. The whole counsel of the word of God must be consulted. Okay, the next step in helping you study the scripture correctly is culture. Think. What was the culture like when this was written? You run into trouble if you try to interpret scripture from a modern Western thinking Greco-Roman mindset. Go study the difference between a biblical Hebrew Near Eastern mindset and a Western Greco-Roman mindset. For example, in scripture, things are not necessarily either or, which is a Western proclivity, but they can be a Hebraic yes and no and both. Remember, Matthew through Revelation was written by believing Hebrews. Although well acquainted with the Roman occupiers, they still thought like Jews and were inspired to write by the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness. Okay, here's an example of how easy it is to misread the actions of a differing culture. There is a video taken during a meeting at Camp David which shows Israeli Ehud Barak attempting to herd Palestinian Yasser Arafat into the door ahead of him. Now, to Western eyes, this might be interpreted as politeness, letting the other go first. Ah, but your presumption would be wrong. We see Arafat is struggling to go last. Why? In the Middle East, the most powerful person enters last. That's why Arafat was so reluctant and not pleased when Ehud walked in last. It was sending a message to the world. So in Scripture, check the culture. What does it mean to them? Okay, next thing in studying scripture, is it literal or is it poetry? Learn to spot the difference between when the Bible is speaking literally, uh, an historical account, or when you're looking at Hebrew poetry. Genesis 1, etc. is an example of an historical account according to learned Hebrew scholars. The patterns which distinguish Hebrew poetry are found at several levels. Sound, meter, word, and imagery. What are the characteristics of ancient Hebrew poetry? Parallelism. Look at Psalm 6-9. Hashem has heard my supplication. Hashem receives my prayer. Then there's quantitative rhythm. Then there's accentual rhythm, having rhythm based on stress rather than on the number of syllables or length of sounds as in some poetry. Then there's the dirges, like Amos 5-1. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. Then there's also anadiplosis. Anadiplosis can involve a single repeated word or the repetition of a group of words. For example, Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Hashem who made heaven and earth. End quote. Then you have acrostics. A poem in which the initial letters of each successive line form a word, phrase, or pattern. The most complete alphabetic acrostics in the Hebrew scriptures are Psalm 25, 34, 37, 11, 112, 119, 145, also Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, and Lamentations 1 through 4. You have to look at the Hebrew to see the acrostic. Listen to this statement from Scripture. He will be like a tree planted by the river. The word like is a signal to not take the phrase literally. The man is not a tree. Here's a, a literal example from Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Quote, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Yehior, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Yom Echad. End quote. This is a literal reading. Day is yom, the common Hebrew word for a 24-hour period. And yes, God is capable of fast-tracking the creative processes, including light. The light of Genesis 1, 1 through 5, is not the same light as the light on day 4 with the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, the next thing in helping you correctly study the scriptures is the original languages. I highly recommend studying Biblical Hebrew if you are serious about studying the Tanakh or Genesis through Malachi. Once you have that down, then consider studying the Greek of Matthew through Revelation. But start with the Hebrew. Start with the foundational scriptures. TorahResource.com offers university-level courses by scholar Tim Haig. I've completed the first semester and found it awesome. But if you're not into languages, fortunately, you do have wonderful access to work done by others. You can start with something like blueletterbible.org and click on the tools to see the Hebrew and Greek words and their meanings. Remember, Strong's is not the end-all, be-all of commentaries, but it's a start. Just reading the scriptures in English, you really do miss a lot of depth that you can't see in the English. Take the Hebrew word shalom. It's often translated peace, but it also means hello and goodbye, prosperity, well-being, etc. Shalom is also a word bathed in covenantal nuance. There is not a single word in English that captures all of the meaning and sense of the Hebrew word shalom. Context is the key in choosing the right meaning. I will say that again. Context determines which definition applies of the multiple de definitions that you can see for a Hebrew word. Lastly, let's discuss the Ruach HaKodesh as teacher, the Holy Spirit, or literally, Spirit of Holiness. Can you understand the Bible by yourself? Some say, it's too difficult. I can't understand. I can't do the commandments. I'm not a studier. These are excuses. Can one understand the Bible? Well, the answer is a Hebraic one. Yes and no and both. We can understand the plain language of the Bible. Listen to what Moshe told the Israelites regarding the commandment, which is another way of saying the entirety of the written Torah, which contains the terms of the ancient covenant. Torah is a finely woven tapestry. Moshe told them, and consequently us, this is what he said in Devarim, Deuteronomy 30, 9-14. Hashem your God will prosper you abundantly, then we drop down, if you obey Hashem your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, the Torah, if you turn to Hashem your God with all your heart and soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it and that we can hear it and observe it, nor is it beyond the sea that we should say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and your heart, that you may observe it. End quote. So yes, we are expected to obey the commandments. And yes, in this passage, there is also an allusion to Messiah Yeshua. You'll, you'll see a midrash on that in the Brit Harashah. This is a yes and yes. And we are not left on our own. God helps us in understanding and knowing how to walk out his will and his ways. Listen to these verses. Look at Job 36, 22. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Then Tehillim, Psalms 119, verse 73. Yud. That's an acrostic, by the way. Yud. That's a Hebrew letter. Yud. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Now here's one that has prophecy in it from Yeshayahu, Isaiah 30, verse 20. Quote, Although the Lord has given you the bread of privation and the water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. 
isn't that in the reality? Messiah Yeshua. We see this in Yohanan, John 13, 13. Yeshua says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. Then we look at the Ruach HaKodesh as our guide and comforter in Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, to those who ask him? End quote. Then also Yochanan, John 14, 15 through 18, Yeshua is speaking, and he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever, that is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as, as orphans. I will come to you. And then verse 21 he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. The Greek word for disclose there, emphanizo, is interesting. It means to manifest, to appear, to declare plainly. It is the heart of the Holy One that we should know and understand and do the things we can. If you are truly seeking truth, God's truth, not the world's, and not what you want to believe, but the truth. Rest assured, he will help you understand. He will also provide good teachers after his own heart so that you don't have to be a lone ranger. But don't just blindly follow what humans say. Always test it against the whole counsel of the word of God, the terms of the covenant, and what Messiah Yeshua modeled for us. Drop down to verse 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear are not mine, but the Father who sent me. End quote. Messiah Yeshua did not come to set up a new religion, but rather to restore proper interpretation of the written Torah, and to show that he is indeed the one of whom the scriptures prophesied. He is the prophet Moshe said would come. He is the lamb Abraham prophesied about that day on Mount Moriah. He is the innocent son of David who would die for the sins of others, which we see foreshadowed in the death of the innocent baby of Bathsheba and David. He took our curses upon himself. See the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness. The snake represents our sin and the resulting curse due, justly so. Look at your sin up there. Acknowledge it, that you have sinned against God. Repent. Stop doing that thing, and you will be healed. See the innocent Lamb of God on the execution stake, the Roman cross, beaten beyond recognition, bruised, bleeding, in pain, thirst, nakedness, taking the punishment that we deserved. He hung there and died because of love, because of mercy. As the goel, he balanced the blood with his own, that we might live and be able to come back inside the circle of the ancient covenant. Yeshua of Nazareth, Nazareth came to provide the way, the only way, back into the ancient blood covenant as our divine kinsman redeemer. Ultimate God, ultimate sin, and ultimate sin requires an ultimate savior. Now he stands in the heavenly temple, daily interceding for us as our Kohen Gadol, high priest, on the order of Melchizedek. In these very dark times, morally, we must stand fast in the faith. And we can't do it on our own. After all, anything good we have comes from him, right? Our faith, our works, our trust, our salvation, they are all gifts from God. No one can boast. We must boast in him. Stand firm, relying on him. He loves us more than we can know. Now let's talk about six steps to determine the truth of a thing. This is a critical thing to learn in order to have discernment. How do you correctly determine the truth of a thing? Well, here are six steps to assist you in getting to the heart of the matter. When confronted about an issue, Ask yourself these things. Number one, what is the original word 
or the original commandment given by God on this issue. Two, what do the terms of the covenant say, the commandments? What did Messiah Yeshua say and do? What is the context, chapter, book, the whole of scriptures? What is the culture of that day? And then, number six, appeal to the Lord to keep you in his truth. It is imperative in this era of moral darkness to be very careful of whom you let be your teacher. Today there is a burgeoning plethora of false teachers. Test every issue. Test every issue. Did I mention test every issue? Test what I say. Test what you say. Charismatic preachers and speakers can make a thing seem plausible even when it's not. Remember, it takes only a little rat poison to poison the glass of truthful water. The sneakiest tactic is to hide the lie amongst all the facts. So don't be lazy. Check it out. How? Again, what is the original word or commandment given by God? What do the terms of the covenant say, the commandments? What did Messiah Yeshua say and do? What is the context? Chapter, book, the whole of scriptures. What is the culture of that day? And appeal to the Lord to keep you in his truth. May your prayer be, Lord, please don't let me ever believe a lie. Because when you are deceived, you are deceived. You can't see clearly. Let the Lord of light bring you into all his truth. We need to cling to him. Not our favorite teacher or YouTube documentary. We need to cling to our creator. Remember, our adversary works towards our destruction. Don't give him the time of day. Let's walk through an issue example, okay? But there are those who claim that the Sabbath can be on any day of the week. I've heard people say something like, well, I can just pick any day of the week to have a day of rest. Wrong. What is the correct answer? Well, what is the original word or commandment by God? takes you right back to Bereshit, Genesis 2, 2 through 3. Quote, By the seventh day, God had completed the work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart, because in it he rested from all his work in which God had created and made. End quote. All right? So God says, the original commandment says, it's on the seventh day, a specific day of the week from creation. All right, well, what do the terms of the covenant say? What do the commandments say in Torah? Then we go to Shemot Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Quote, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, set apart. Six days you will labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Hashem your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your male or female servants, your cattle or the sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, the next step in confronting an issue. What did Messiah Yeshua do? Look at Luke 4.16. 4, Quote, And he, Yeshua, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Shabbat and stood up to read, end quote. So the claim of, I can just pick any day of the week to have a, a day of rest, is a conclusion based on a false premise. Go study scripture, and you'll see God never countermanded his original commandment to keep the seventh day of the week from creation as holy, set apart, kadosh. If you put into practice checking what people claim, using these steps and appealing to God for his truth, you won't get fooled as easily. You will have discernment and not fall into conspiracy theories and lies. Okay, let's move on now to um, the biblical definition of the Hebrew word for first fruits and a brief little talk on the biblical calendars. This episode one is really a foundations review before we move on. So let's take a look at the biblical definition of the term first fruits. In Hebrew, it's bikur or plural bikurim. It's used 18 times in scripture, and the meaning 
is first fruits from grains and fruits, early ripened things. Bikorim, Bikor, Bikorim. Now let's look at the calendars. Okay, there are actually two calendars in Scripture. The first one starts on Nisan 1 in the spring, and that one is used to determine the festival dates. The second one begins in the fall on Tishri 1, and it heralds the start of the agricultural calendar. It's called Rosh Kodesh, or Head of the Year. Tishrei 1 is also the Moed, appointed time, Yom Teruah, Day of Shouts, or Day of Trumpets. And note that this is the only feast of the Lord to fall on a new moon. Hmm, could be some significance there, huh? Now, this arguing over the calendars is an attack from the adversary. Unfortunately, the enemy loves to divide us and keep us bickering at each other. People come up with different ideas of when the festival year on Nisan 1 begins, a barley issue. Here's the thing. The feasts of the Lord were entrusted to the Jewish nation to guard. They are not going to forget when the seventh-day Sabbath is, no matter where they are in the diaspora. They also would not forget how to do the Moedim, the appointed times, or when they were supposed to be, because they too contain holy Shabbats. So what's the truth of the calendar issue? Well, what do we do? We, we ask ourselves, what did Messiah Yeshua do? Go read Matthew through John. You will find our Messiah with the Jewish people going up to Jerusalem for the feast. Now, if they had the calendar wrong, do you think for one second that the man who overturned the money changer tables and drove the animals out of the temple, do you really think that he would not have hesitated to correct them on their festival calendar if it were wrong? Also, ask yourself, what did Messiah Yeshua say? Not one word about correcting the calendar. And he was all about restoring proper interpretation and application of the Torah. Not one word on correcting the calendar. We are to imitate Messiah, not some human. Until he returns, I will continue to go to hebcal.com. It's like hebrewcalendar.com, but it's shortened to hebcal. Dot com and join with the Jewish people as to the dates of the feasts. If there are any problems, Messiah will let us know when he comes and he'll rectify it. I will stand with the Jewish people. Well, that's it for episode one of three of Fascinating First Fruits, the Feast, and a Surprising Revival. T tune into episode two, where we'll have a closer look at the Feast of the Lord involving first fruits. In episode three, we will explore what is happening today in regards to a very surprising revival that is first fruits in nature. Perhaps a sign that the day is drawing closer to the Lord's return. As always, remember, he has told us the end from the beginning. Cling to him. This has been the Shuv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. Lila Tov. Good night. Pray for eyes to see stones. They should have known better. He's always made it plain. As in days of old, they were clueless until it began to rain. Shoo sure.